Okay, thanks. Hello, everyone. Uh, before we heard from the inevitable Dave Grinspoon, and so I guess that makes me the evitable Dave Brain. Uh, and, and yeah, I'm, I've only been around here um, with the Nexus team for two to three weeks, I think, something like that. And so this is uh, a series of ideas that's still forming and a team that's still forming. And so I'm I'm mostly going to talk about uh, big ideas, although I'll allude to results that we already have in hand. So the theme uh, for the group that we have is exoplanetary atmospheric escape validated by solar system observations. And those would be observations from Mars, from Venus, and from Earth as well, maybe even Titan when uh, things get going. And uh, applying what we've learned from solar system objects from orbiting spacecraft and uh, using those observations to validate models and porting those models over to exoplanetary situations. Uh, within that general idea, um, including one that's a bit tangential, ions, three for neutrals, and one that doesn't really discriminate uh, between whether you're charged or not, uh, on the MAVEN spacecraft mission, which is currently orbiting Mars, we're starting to evaluate not only total loss rates for ions and neutrals, but parse those uh, loss rates by the different mechanisms that accelerate particles to escape velocity in the first place. It turns out those mechanisms um, are important to understand because different mechanisms are responsible for accelerating different species, massive species versus light and so star and the planet most for loss of atmospheres and we have big fancy models that we can construct and absolutely should be constructing but but is it possible to construct simple scaling loss for uh, what removes atmospheres the excess but it turns out Mars you can see that there are let's see if I can get a mouse I can or a cursor you can see that uh, measurements of the exosphere of Mars give you uh, densities and temperatures. You can use those densities and temperatures to compute the thermal escape from a planet just because an ensemble of gas has an average kinetic energy. Some particles are above average and they escape more easily. And that's thermal escape. The thermal escape rate goes from high to low over a matter of months and can be put in context with uh, escape rate predictions from the atmosphere going back years or even decades. Uh, it turns out that we're not quite sure what, what controls that variability. It could be dust storms uh, on Mars, it could be solar drivers, or it could be something else. And how does this port over to exoplanets? Are there lessons here from Mars and comets that should be considered when we're talking about planets around other stars? And where is the variability driven from above or below? Finally, this is the one that I added this morning, and uh, maybe someone will talk about this later today, but in another part of my research world, in another part of my work, I have a student who's thinking about impactors, asteroids and comets, what they do to planetary atmospheres. This is a, a question that's being continually answered, and, and um, it's starting to be revived a bit as a topic, but it turns out when she takes different models, different assumptions for what an individual impact does, does to an atmosphere, and those different models are represented by the different colors in the panels. Uh, so no matter whose model she takes, if she puts 10,000 impactors into the Venus atmosphere, the Venus atmospheric uh, thickness goes down by a percent or two, something like that. And so the atmosphere actually decreases in abundance, except for one model increases. If instead you put 10,000 impactors into Earth, uh, Earth's atmosphere today, the atmospheric abundance would increase, and Mars decreases. And there are different assumptions about how the impactors come in, um, but the target uh, matches Earth or Venus or Mars in all of these cases. And so this is another process to think of, but it's not only a, a loss process, it's a source process. It turns out impacts sometimes giveth and sometimes they taketh away. And that should see, say, say should, should other exoplanets behave similarly. Okay, a couple of challenges. 
uh, to keep in mind, or that at least we'll be keeping in mind. Escape involves a huge range of physical processes. This god-awful diagram right here is one I created for the MAVEN proposal, and it shows all of the different escape processes that we thought would be happening from Mars. Blue denotes neutral particles, red denotes charged particles, and all the stuff from the sun in the top left are things that can cause escape to vary solar energetic particles, CMB, solar wind, EUV. It's a big, messy topic. And it turns out no one model can contain all of the relevant physics, at least today. Even coupled models fail to contain all of the relevant physics to capture all of these different escape processes that can be happening on Venus, Earth, or Mars. Not only that, the processes talk to each other. There's feedback between the processes. So modeling, while excluding some of the processes, may lead you to a wrong answer, and may not. We just don't know right now. And as I said before, different processes are important for different species. Another thing is that even if you decide which processes you're going to model, ion escape, and you run global plasma models for ion escape from Mars with the exact same input conditions, you can get very different answers. So here are seven different models operate, operating under different physical assumptions, ranging from very fluid to adding more and more terms to Ohm's law to finally breaking the fluid assumption and going to kinetic ions that are individual motions of individual particles. And you can see that the um, uh, flux of uh, molecular oxygen ions is very different from the different models. And that leads to great differences in escape rate more than two orders of magnitude difference in escape rate from seven different models all run for the same set of conditions. That doesn't mean that modeling is untrustworthy. It just means that uh, examining the assumptions of the models and the validity of the models in different situations is very important. Some of these models may be dead wrong. Uh, some of these models have, may have uh, regions where they do a good job and other regions where they just can't do a good job because of the assumptions that go into the model. So the models must be validated with observations. And even then, extrapolating the models to different conditions can be tricky. Uh, a last challenge, uh, as alluded to before by Bill Moore, is that the lower atmosphere influences the upper atmosphere. Every time you think you've hit your lower boundary condition when you're modeling escape, it turns out whatever's below that also turns out to be important. And so you keep having to couple down, 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 down. So here's one thing we're learning about Mars when we were examining the, the great variation, order of magnitude variation in escape rates of hydrogen from the exosphere. What could cause that? It could be driven from above, but it turns out there have also been observations of water in the middle atmosphere of Mars, uh, uh, variation in water. And it turns out over here on the left, if you assume that you put different parcels of water at different altitudes in the Martian atmosphere, in isolation of all the other curves on the diagrams. You have to take each one individually. And you look at the atmospheric response, it turns out putting water at about 80 kilometers creates a huge atmospheric response of a more than an order to a magnitude variation in escape rates. So things that are happening low down, of course, propagate upward. And there's a sweet spot for where, you're, where the water is being added to the atmosphere that makes the escape rate really bloom. If you add it too low, then all the collisions prevent it from propagating upward uh, more efficiently. So here's our team. So far, it, I would say it's a small team. It's me. I like ions and plasma. And Michael Chaffin is a postdoc, a brilliant postdoc at University of Colorado. He likes neutral particles, and so we talk to each other uh, back and forth from time to time. You know, it's like the um, Romeo and Juliet, I guess. Uh, no, it's not really like that at all. Um, <laughs> Except, well, never mind. Okay. Um, uh, but I have about 16 names written down of people that I would consider working with, including people from the MAVEN team, uh, international collaborators. And also, it turns out, about a month or two before Nexus was ever announced, we started a discussion group at University of Colorado called Star Planet Interactions. It includes astrophysicists, heliophysicists, and planetary scientists, data people, and modelers people who like plasma and people who and solar wind and people who like neutral particles and photons. There are about 20 of us in that group as well. So I, I don't want a very big team. I'd actually like a kind of a focused, maybe six person max team so that we can make um, some focused progress and contributions. But we'll see as I'm listening here uh, over the next day where we're headed. 
So this is my last slide. Uh, I'm really looking forward to thinking about all of these questions and, and uh, taking what we've learned from solar system objects and porting it over in the realm of atmospheric escape. But mostly I'm, I'm looking forward to just learning a whole bunch. All right, thanks. Almost, uh, almost all assume the same lower boundary condition. Uh, these first three here are all identical lower boundary conditions because it's all different versions of BATS RS. Um, uh, this model over here is a hybrid model, and that has a hard surface lower boundary, a conducting inner surface. Um, but these other two hybrid models assume the same lower boundary condition as the, the three at the top left. So it's all the same lower boundary condition. Um, some are MHD, Hall MHD, multi-fluid MHD, and then the two at the bottom are hybrid uh, assumptions. So there's different physics operating in the, in the models on the same boundary conditions. But, but in the fluid models, it's actually the source term. Yep, it's identical. It's identical. Yeah, and, and it's 3D source term in the two hybrid models as well, and it's identical. Um, so, so this is a wonderful question, and you're asking me about two weeks too early, um, because like Bill Moore, I also have a review paper for a JGR um, that's, that's um, atmospheric escape from unmagnetized planets. And so Fran Bagenal is writing the Pluto section. I'm writing Mars. We have someone for Venus, Comets, and Titan as well. And so um, everyone has turned in their sections except for Fran Bagenal and me. And so uh, as soon as we write those sections, I can answer that a little better. But Fran and I have discussed the fact that, you know, Comet, Pluto, Mars, Venus, they're all on a spectrum. So a, a couple of things we've heard from other speakers this morning has to do with the redox state of the planetary atmosphere. And, and I think historically, from the terrestrial atmospheric modeling community, we assume that hydrogen and nothing else escapes up the top. But when you start incorporating these other processes, my understanding is you can start to escape oxygen as well, which would have <coughs> implications for everything from the origin of, or the, the evolution of Earth's atmosphere to uh, false positives on other atmospheres to all kinds of stuff. Um, so can you comment on that a little bit? How, how wrong might, it, might we be? <laughs> I guess is the question. And when we're assuming that hydrogen is either the only thing or predominantly uh, I, I don't think that's correct at all. I think it depends upon which regime you're in. But thermal, es let me take Mars, which is the object that I know best. Um, thermal escape um, acts on hydrogen and deuterium. And so if they're going to escape, it's primarily through that channel. But there's photochemical escape of neutral particles. And oxygen is the chief species that's escaping there with rates that are comparable to that from thermal escape of hydrogen. Then when you start adding charged particles in, it's O plus, O2 plus, a little bit of H plus. There's a lot of bookkeeping involved, I think, before anyone can use escape measurements to constrain uh, what's happening redox-wise. Uh-oh. Oh, no. It's in. In fact, just following up on Sean's question and your answer, isn't it, isn't it true? Is it still true? It was true at one point, or it was thought to be true, that, that uh, water escapes stuff stoichiometrically from, from Mars through some feedback uh, with 
with between the hydrogen and oxygen uh, rates? Yeah, so this has been discussed, but the, the times that I've been at meetings or re read papers in which it's discussed, it's usually within the context of a subset of processes. For example, ion escape from Venus, from Venus Express, they say, oh, hydrogen and oxygen are escaping in the correct ratio. It's 2.2, and that extra 0.2 is in the error bar. Um, but I haven't seen all of the processes um, grouped together. And that could just be because I've missed it. It may have been done, but I haven't seen anything that I think um, puts together all of the processes at once. I, I don't think there's any reason right now, based on what we know about escape alone, to say that it has to be escaping in the right ratio. There, there were some papers, um, this is going back to the 70s or 80s, describing a feedback mechanism by which it was supposed to work that way. I don't know if they're valid or not, but I can dig them up. Yeah, I, I, meant, I meant by what we know about escape, I mean just tallying what we see escaping, as opposed to thinking about yeah. the underlying physics, which is actually the much more important thing to do. Yeah. All right, sorry to take so much of your time. I'm leaving. Yeah,